Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to this inaugural lecture. <clears throat> As we try to rebuild after quite a hiatus, the tradition of inaugural lectures, we really are trying to build an idea that we recognize them as a celebration of who we are and also a celebration of who we can become. I want to welcome particularly today Professor Shanaz Matthews, um, her husband and, and daughter and niece who are in the audience this, this afternoon, and her dad and daughter who are online with us. We're 110 years old this year. On June the 6th, we celebrated the 110th anniversary of this faculty. And as we've been doing that celebration, we've been recognizing that we occupy a space here in observatory that is the place of the stars. In the first people's traditions, they call this place Amirodi Chais. And it's in that spirit that we gather today to recognize that we are not the stars, but it is the stars that illuminate the work that we do. And as we, as we get that light, we share it around us to the people that we encounter. But in, in coming into this anniversary year, we have to acknowledge our many histories. And in acknowledging our histories, we begin to redefine our futures. And an inaugural lecture is it's at that essential point where our legacies intersect with our promises. Because we reflect on the scholarship and the career of a single person, but recognize that even as they declare themselves as scholars in a community of scholars, they promise a future that may be different. Because as we acknowledge our complex and very entangled histories on a campus such as ours, we gather really in order to build a future of promise. When I reflected on, on um, previous inaugural lectures, I, I noted in, in the UCT, in our faculty particularly, some of the things that people have said over the years at an inaugural lecture. In 2019, Khalid Dandara in his inaugural lecture said, the work we're doing is in response to the third sustainable development goal as stipulated by the United Nations to ensure healthy lives and promote well-being for all at all ages. Ambrose Wonkham in his lecture that year said, we believe that in the next 10 years we should have more African scholars based on the African continent studying genetics who will produce enough data relevant to the continent. But perhaps the most relevant one to today's lecture, seeing it is, as it is so located in the stories of women and children, I want to refer to the Professor of Early Childhood, Childhood Education, Professor Karen Morris, who in her 2018 inaugural lecture said some of these things about children and childhood. That church, the child and childhood has not been included in the post-colonial discourses about transformation of the higher education spaces and curriculum, despite the critique and contestation that arises in early childhood development. And she goes on to reflect on the fact that this is the time of capitalism, col colonialism and militarism. It's also the time of schooling that prepares children for a neoliberal, individually competitive workplace. And so for me, all of these all of these inaugural lectures give us a sense of what scholars are trying to translate for us in the things that they know and the extent to which they intersect with the society around us. But in conclusion, I want to just reflect today that I couldn't help as I prepared and thought about this lecture and, and uh, I won't uh, threaten singing this afternoon because I can't rely on my voice at this time. But the thing that I thought about very strongly was that song that I first heard sung by George Benson. I believe that children are our future. Teach them well and let them lead the way. Show them all the beauty they possess inside. Give them a sense of pride to make it easier. But also let the children's laughter remind us of how we once were. 
And so today, as we celebrate Professor Shanaz Matthews and the achievement of the full professorship status in this community, I'm going to invite uh, Ruzani Mulayiwa, who is the head of the Department of Pediatrics and Child Health, to introduce her. Uh, thank you very much uh, for this um, a privilege. It's actually a really great privilege for me. And it is actually my first time doing this as head of department. This is the first inaugural that I'm at as a head of department and introducing someone. So a number of things that I'll say in terms of introducing now I think that you all who know her have known this. But as you know, she is a professor in the Faculty of Health Sciences um, of the University of Cape Town. And she now has had more than 30 years working and having great experience in the area of fighting for the rights of women and children, and has worked within civil society organizations as an academic and technical advisor to government programs, uh, specializing in violence against women and children. We know that right now she's currently involved in a range of um, projects and activities that focus on children's rights uh, to health care as well as protection in the context of poverty and things that we know are quite close to her heart. And prior to assuming a role as the director of the Children's Institute, um, uh, Shinaz um, had been working in the South African Medical Research Council for a decade uh, where she served as an international advisory board member for the UNICEF Innocenti Research Office uh, on the multi-country study on the drivers of violence, as well as being a member of the lead investigator group in the Department of Science and Technology's um, NRF uh, Center of Excellence in Human Development uh, at the University of the Witwatersrand. She was nominated in January 2020 to serve as a commissioner on the Lancet Commission on Gender-Based Violence and Maltreatment of Young People. Prof. Matthew's research interests include violence against women and children, as well as pathways to violent masculinities using both qualitative and quantitative approaches. And she has led two national epidemiology studies on female homicide and led a study on the socio-cultural context of intimate femicide. Chenaz uh, led a seminal research project to establish the national prevalence of uh, fertile child abuse in the context of child murders. She has led the development and evaluation of the child death review model for South Africa at two pilot sites and led the rollout of the CDR teams to the Western Cape Africa. I can read this on and on and on. And I'm telling you this because I'm going to stop because they are stuck. And, and, and here's the reason why I'm stopping in terms of my introduction. What I've just read now and what more I can read is something that you can easily pick up by just asking it to email <laughs> you her CV. I was, I've not mentioned anything about the many papers that she has written. I've not mentioned the number of postgraduate students that she has supervised. I've not spoken about her age index or the number of citations that she has behind her name. I could, if you want me to, and we can spend the whole day here before she has a inaugural. <clears throat> but it was quite convenient for me to try and latch on her a bio sketch that summarizes what we all know about her life in order to introduce her. As I mentioned before, this is my first day doing this, and I was at a distinct advance, disadvantage of having to do this with someone with such a big resume that she now has as well as being unfortunate that, that working mainly in medical pediatrics for a very long time, I was only recently quite close to working with her once I became the head of department. You know, after having listened to the other inaugural lectures and hearing people being uh, introduced, I thought I had this night to kind of call her and ask her where she was born, where she grew up, because that would be like, feel like really introducing her properly with her. But I realized I already knew where she was born and where she grew up because, uh, because she was born and grew up in a country that said no to all of her dreams. Even before she knew she had dreams. And she used the defiance to that no, to fight for others. 
So, sorry, I've become emotional with this, with the, this in August and a woman's man. But to me, she typifies a real professor. Not born of the ad hominem process of being counting, but rather the ad hominem that says this is the woman as a reflection of how she has lived a life and the academic part is a reflection of the own life. It reflects a curriculum vitae, which is the cause of her life. And her academic life has been a response. I mean, last time when we were talking about this, why did you become an academic? For her, it became the only tool to respond to a colleague within that space. So, as I conclude, Maybe I need to reintroduce her to all of you, including her family, and maybe to herself. By the family that I know is very close to her heart, you know, reintroduce you, her to you, Shamil, who has, you know, walked beside her for the last three plus decades. Reintroduce her to her daughter, you know, you know, Zahra, and I think Raisa is online, she's managed to join and um, Nuran, her other daughter, niece, and to reintroduce her to herself, almost in the spirit of T.S. Eliot's little getting <laughs> that encourage us that in our exploration we come back to know the place we stand for the first time. And I'll do that using the words of one of my favorite um, poets, Christopher Okibo of Nigeria. In conclusion, he says, for she was a shrub among the poplars, needing more roots, more sap to grow to sunlight, thirsting for sunlight. A low growth among the forest. Into the soul, the selves extended their branches into the moments of each living hour, feeling for audience, straining thin among the echoes. And out of for the solitude, voice and soul with selves unite riding the echoes, horsemen of the apocalypse, and crowned with oneself, the name displays its foliage hanging low, a green cloud above the forest. This comes from Southern Limits, which is from Labyrinth. So I reintroduce you to yourself as I call you forward now, where you started as a shrub among the poplars, and ultimately end as a green cloud above the forest. Thank you, Ritsani and Lionel, for all those kind words and the wonderful introduction from for introducing my, me to myself again. Um, for those of you that know me well, you'll know I don't really enjoy public speaking. So, in preparing for today, it's taken me some thinking into just what I want to share with you and how much I want to share with you today about myself. Um, but what I do want to say is that I really dedicate today's lecture to all those women and children out there who have been experiencing violence every day of their life and for those that have lost, the many women and children who have lost their lives due to violence. And I really think that it's fitting, being Women's Month, as Rosanna says, that this because my inquiry and my research is only possible because I've researched them as subjects. So today I'm not hoping to bore you with lots of graphs and numbers, but I would love to leave you with an understanding of my body of work that I have done over the past three decades, and also what still keeps me awake up at night, and often ask myself, what have I achieved through all this work over the past Three decades. I'm going to take you on a journey, a bit of a roller coaster ride. I want to, to describe and, and share with you my journey, not just of being an academic, but really where I've come from as, an, as a young person, as an activist, and lastly, as an academic. And I see myself as an engaged scholar 
in the words of what how UCT describes it. But to get to know me, we've got to look at where I've come from. I started at UCT on this journey 40 years ago as a young 17 year old who joined UCT, but needed to apply for what was then because UCT was a white institution at the time. And I needed to apply for a permit to attend this institution. And if I ask my 17 year old self, was this what you dreamed of? It was certainly not in the realm of possibility. Or I didn't see it as a possibility to be a professor at the university. And in fact, UCT at the time in 1983, when I started as a young um, student, was quite an alienating place and in many ways, not a welcoming place. When I joined 10 years ago as the director of the Children's Institute, it did take me to some of those spaces and in many ways was still not a welcoming place and I had to define a space for myself. So, reflecting back on this trajectory, I see myself from developing from a practitioner to an activist and today I see myself, this journey not being linear at all, but what I do see myself being quite an accidental academic. I didn't set out to be one. All this work that I've done over the past 30 years or so, what underpins it all is really the student activism that I've been part, that I was part of, where politics was taught besides my maths in my classroom. And Marion asked me, where did I go to school? And I said, at Harold Cressy. And I think, you know, it is testimony to those teachers who taught us every day, but didn't just teach us maths and science and English. And I think, you know, my English teacher, um, uh, uh, Miss Keys, Helen Keys, had an interesting conversation with me because as I started my academic career or as I contemplated starting it, I wanted to be a social worker. And she said to me, you know, Shanaz, what does a social worker do? It really supports the system that we're trying to dismantle. So here I am, Mrs. Keys, and you're not around anymore, but I'm hoping that I did work towards dismantling some of the system. So that my work is underpinned what I see as about a human rights framework. So if I think about the work that I've done towards violence against women, it's certainly underpinned by the law, um, which for the first time condemned violence against women as a form of human rights only in 19, 19, 1992, at the time when my daughter was born. Secondly, the United Nations Convention on the Rights of, of, of the Child certainly in, obliges states to protect children from all forms of physical, mental violence, injury, as well as sexual abuse. All of these instruments inform the work I do on a daily basis. And in addition, the Constitution provides a set of basic rights to both women and children, of which fundamental to these rights are freedom and security and freedom from violence and these are really important um, fundamentally it informs the research I do and it underpins all the research questions I ask. So let's reflect where my research began. So I'm not going to talk about my initial work but let's talk about what has influenced my research I'm not going to talk to you about these research findings because these come from 1998-1999 and you can see those look quite dated but they're still important. What lessons did I learn um, from this at that stage in my career? I learned the realization that credible evidence is really really important for policymakers and to shift legislation and policy and I'm looking at Lily because I think a lot of the work that we did at that time was so important what I learned about working in communities when I was at the Gender Advocacy Programme in the late 90s was about how you can shift policy by including and preparing women to do their own submissions in Parliament to shift the discourse and ensure that policy is relevant for the lives of women. 
The first, making the act work. I worked with Debbie Button uh, looking at budget allocations for the implementation of the Domestic Violence Act. As a young researcher, she influenced me and threw me in the deep end and I had to present this research at the Second United Nations Conference in 2000 on women in New York. I was incredibly young, but what it did talk to was and what it made me understand was the power of evidence and how evidence even from the global south can shift discourse and how the work we do from the global south is as important as those northern researchers at the time that you thought were, had, were probably more knowledgeable. My evaluation research post the implementation of the legislation was really critical to shift my understanding and critical for me to understand that legislation is not enough to shift experiences of women and that we've got to be thinking about other approaches and I'll come back to that later. Important part of my life was working side by side with other women's activists or feminists at the time in the network on violence against women and again I look at Lily and Tanya in the in the distance and I'm so pleased you're sitting right there because the work we did together was so powerful in terms of learning how we can build strong coalitions and partnerships because as a single person you cannot change the discourse out there but as a collective we're able to shift the minds and um, we're able to show patterns of what needs to be put in place. What, taught, what I was taught through working within the network side by side and at a young age being the chair of the, of the network on violence against women was that women needed to play, be placed at the centre for them to bring about change. We can bring men along that journey, but we've got to take and build, um, build that leadership within women. I've also learned at that stage very early on that community-based membership structures and facilitating social mobilization from the ground up are critical if we're wanting to change public discourse. And I think that's still very important right now. So for me, what I learned significantly at that early stage of my career is how important civil society play in the development in, as well as implementation of policies that's still relevant for us today. Early conceptualization of gender-based violence and thinking about how we thought about it then was really around how physical forms of intimate partner violence intersex with, intersects with um, sexual violence by intimate partners as well as sexual violence by others, not known, and then bringing in sexual violence. But what I have grown to understand also in terms of expanding my own view and how violence is conceptualized is that there are multiple forms of violence that women and children experience across their life course and we cannot silo them, they intersect in multiple ways and therefore we've got to be thinking about how we conceptualise violence because certainly forms of violence that children experience are also gendered and we cannot keep it out of the discourse and therefore we've got a national strategic plan on gender-based violence that doesn't really take into account experiences children have and therefore have not taken children along the journey and don't think about how early experiences shape later outcomes. And therefore it's important for us also to recognize the emotional and psychological dimensions that faces one when you experience violence. So as I said, I'm taking you through a trajectory and different phases of my own research. Working at the South African Medical Council was really the second part or second decade of my career and solidly looked at intimate femicide at the time when we didn't have real estimates for violence against women across South Africa. The body of work at the South African Medical Research Council is probably still one of the most powerful to allow us to understand uh, intimate femicide or femicide as it's now called in South Africa. So if we think about understanding intimate femicide, we know that South Africa's rate of intimate femicide is double the global rate. And it's the leading cause of female homicide in, in South Africa. 
We also know that intimate femicide is the leading cause of female homicide in South Africa and the killing of a partner by an intimate of, of, of a woman by her intimate partner is not an isolated event and that such killings are more likely to occur in the context of gender inequalities and gender hierarchies as we see in South Africa where the prevailing social and environmental culture provides the space for men to be violent towards their partner and also kill their partners. So what do we learn about intimate femicide in South Africa and femicide and drawing on the work from the, that I did whilst at the Medical Research Council, we see that in 1999, and I'm going to talk to three points in time, in 1999, the Thinking about, and when you look at the percentages, you see that the proportion of female intimate femicides versus non-intimate femicides were virtually equal. By 2009, intimate femicide far exceeded in um, non-intimate femicides. And what we see in 2017, we're starting to see a decline in the rate of intimate femicide. So if you start thinking about rates, and that's comparing across populations, and I didn't include it here, what we are seeing is that the femicide rate in South Africa have actually declined. So although we see more reported in the media, it doesn't necessarily mean that we're actually having more femicide cases at the moment. And our daily rate of intimate femicide is still at three a day, which is incredibly high. But what is encouraging is we're not seeing the numbers increase. So no matter whether we get it reported, we most likely get it more reported in the media. I want you to also reflect on two of the main risk factors. I'm going to talk about gun violence first. So in terms of the intimate femicide data, we really use the gun violence, the data we had on gun violence very strategically to influence the firearm legislation that has been formulated in the mid 2000s, we were able to get firearm legis the firearm legislation to take recognition of the seriousness of gun violence in intimate relationships. And what we see is really policy informed reductions. So what you see from to 1999 to 2009, a significant drop in the theme, numbers of female uh, intimate femicides by guns. And this is really about the firearms legislation being implemented and significant reduction. And similarly, so in non-intimate femicides, because what we saw at that stage was the implementation of the firearms legislation and it being implemented. What we do see for 2017 is that we actually reverse in our rates because gun control is no longer on the agenda and we have seen guns in our communities and increasing in our homicide rates overall as well. Reflecting on alcohol as another risk factor, and a lot have been written about this, the work on intimate femicide has certainly showed us that the pattern of alcohol use prior to the murders of women by intimate partners is certainly different in South Africa compared to other countries. Women who are killed by intimate partners have more than double the legal limit of alcohol in their bloodstreams. But what's really, really important is when you start looking at that pattern, that women who are killed by guns are absolutely sober. So they don't have alcohol in their stream, in their, um, in their bloodstream. But there are high levels of intoxication amongst women who are killed by sharp or blunt force injuries. And what that tells us is that the interpersonal violence within those relationships drive some of those patterns. And what's really important here is that we don't know the levels of alcohol in the men who kill their partners, and that's just our, our criminal justice system. But the association between intimate partner killings and high blood alcohol level is certainly very important because it does tell us that women are not able to protect themselves when they that's severely intoxicated. <laughs> Taking you on a slightly different journey. So one I also wanted to understand, besides knowing all these numbers, and I wanted to understand how men come to kill intimate partners. So what are some of the pathways for men to take on violent masculinities? And 
I did qualitative work with men in prison and for nearly two years went to see men in prison virtually every week. And I spent time going to prison and debriefing myself on my, on my way back. So Marmesbury Prison got to know very well as well as Victor Pesser. We are saw men mainly in maximum security and the and I do think ethics would probably not allow this research now because I would see men on their own and I would be locked behind closed doors. So very interesting and I was on my own and didn't want a warden in the room with me. So think about the ethics around that. But a very important part of me understanding and you probably ask how I did that, but it was about seeing the man in front of me and speaking to him and understanding what his story was. And in their accounts, they reflect on childhoods that were rough and hard. Their stories present childhoods with very limited positive attention from mothers, where some mothers' accounts of how they were raised bordered on abuse and neglect. Absent fathers were who were emotionally not involved in, in the lives of these men had a profound impact on how they viewed themselves and shaped their identity. Positive male role models were not were absent in families. And what you see is these men identifying with antisocial, aggressive models of masculinity within the community. And for most of these men, they sought affirmation outside the family. And for, the, for a number of these men, it led to involvement in gangs and crime activities because they did not find that in the home. So thinking about so what makes men, what, what make, drives these men or kill? It's, my work has shown that their childhoods are certainly shaped by wanting women who they can themselves admire and respect. But what we do see is that neglect and abuse in these in the formative years had a profound effect on their own identity. The poor parenting practices, which included absence of fathers and mothers, made these men feel powerless, inferior and unloved, and in many ways acted as a pathway for them to get involved in violence and crime. There was also a complex interplay between social factors and emotional factors then that influenced the formation of violent masculinities. And men's masculinities certainly are shaped their behaviours and define their practices particularly with intimate relationships and as I see now also in the relationships with their own children and their violent practices are, are definitely linked to their own emotional vulnerabilities when combined with social norms within that community. So what did they want in the women that they killed? These men wanted relationships that was rooted in how they saw themselves and the notions of what they saw as being a successful man. Men wanted to be respected and in turn wanted women they could respect. At the beginning of relationships and when it, you know, I, I kind of did histories and they could tell me their, their stories. And at the beginning of relationships, it was always about finding this ideal partner and they idolized the perfect woman. And we all know being in relationships, no relationship is perfect. And soon you become to see each other's flaws. And it is within the, this disillusionment that only the flaws become visible. And these discourses of betrayal and inability to control these women in when nearly half of the women that came to be killed were about to leave or had left the intimate partners. So we see this as a heightened time of women being killed. So the ultimate betrayal these men spoke about was either for a woman to have an affair, whether that was real or imagined, and they saw that as a transgression that allowed them to kill her. So the act of killing is really about a desperate way of taking back control of a relationship they feel that lost control of. So what we do see and just conceptually coming out of that work of working with men is how to think about disrupting pathways of violence. 
So thinking about the parental home environment, we see IPV in the home, and certainly um, as well as age of the mother, maternal absence, paternal absence, mental health, including substance abuse of the mother, as well as substance abuse of the father, as all important factors then that lead to negative childhood outcomes, which includes conduct disorders, poor school outcomes, as well as physical, sexual, emotional abuse and neglect. These in turn inform our understanding of some of the psychological outcomes, which include low empathy, limited self-regulation, low self-esteem, insecure sense of the self, as well as aggressive behavior in this group of men. Male behaviors then are predicated on an emphasis of toughness, dominance and control over women, male sexual entitlement, and use of violence against men, uh, use, use of violence against women, as well as children. And this is really, really important in, as we think about what do we need to put in place to interrupt violence. We certainly need to start thinking about how do we reduce childhood factors in order to reduce perpetration. So, thinking about my trajectory, an important next step for me was when I entered and, and started working at the Children's Institute. That took me on a bit of a different trajectory where I merged my work on violence against women and starting to think about what are the pathways for men to become violent. It took me back to childhood and certainly starting to think more about violence against children. And importantly, in my work that I have been doing at the Children's Institute and as early as the 2014 child gauge, it was really important to start thinking about a life force understanding of violence. That violence starts early on, it starts, and that we've got to think about how violence affects the individual at different phases of their lives. But what we do see is that Pregnant women who are exposed to violence, that we forget that it has an impact on the unborn child. The work that I've done on child homicides, and I'll talk to this a little bit more, certainly shows us that infanticide is a hidden problem in South Africa, particularly, where we don't see the numbers, but we certainly an underreported um, problem, but it is directly related to the mother's own mental health during her pregnancy and soon thereafter. Young children, we know, are particularly vulnerable to violence in the home, including harsh physical punishment, witnessing domestic violence. Yet we know very little about this because children at that young age are unable to report it. We know as children venture out of the home and start going to school, they are exposed to violence not just in the home any longer, but also at school and in the community. And for adolescents, the, the environment itself is one that is risky, where young women are then starting dating relationships and we're starting to see the emergence of an increase in sexual violence as well as the emergence of intimate partner violence. And young women would also be exposed to, um, in adolescence, the risk of male-on-male -male peer violence, which increases during adolescence. And therefore, one has to take into account the trajectories of violence and the different phases that of the life force. I work on the Birth to 20 study, and the Birth to 20, for those of you who don't know it, is one of the largest run child and health longitudinal cohort studies in Africa. And it tracks about more than 2,000 children who were born in Soweto in the year 1990. So the work we did on the birth to 20 study had shown us that 99% of that birth cohort that was born, uh, young uh, babies who were born in the year 1990, had either experienced or had been exposed to violence across the life force. And that's really significant because what it really says is that in that particular country, virtually all children had either experienced or ex been exposed to violence. And in fact, greater proportions of boys, nearly 50% of boys compared to about 50% of girls, 
had experienced multiple forms of violence across their life force. And what this, um, these numbers are just telling us is that children across their life force experience violence, but that the experiences of violence peaks during the adolescent years. I think what's really also important is that we underreport the early years because we just children just don't have the ability to tell us what's happening to them. Pathways to violence to violence during childhood, and I'm I'm just going to give you the high level news from this because it's a complicated structural pathway equation model. And what this work is really telling us that in simple explanations, children are at elevated risk of experience in violence when one or neither of the parents are present. And that's really important in a country like South Africa, where nearly, yeah, I think, you know, only about a third of children live with a parent in South Africa. So that's really, really important for us to understand. We also see in this model then that exposure to drugs and alcohol and crime, either in the home or community, is a pathway to taking on to experiencing violence, as well as when there's conflict in the home. So I think it's really important for us to start thinking about how we disrupt these pathways. My work on homicide shows us that violence also kills. The first national study on child homicide in <clears throat> South Africa shows us that more than a thousand children are killed in the context of homicide yearly. But most importantly is that nearly half of these children who are murdered are murdered in the context of fatal child abuse. 45% of those children who are killed in of these murders that are in the context of fatal child abuse, most of those are with children, as you can see from the right end body, are children under the age of five. And that's really, really important because those are children that can't tell us what's happening and no one has identified that the family is in trouble or that they at this. So in terms of how we've used this evidence, and I think I want to come back to this because evidence is not just about producing a paper. What have we done and, and what is this evidence meant? So what we do know from child homicide study and what we have learned is that child homicides were low priority for police in terms of the investigation. Very few of those fatal child abuse cases had a positive case outcome. In fact, when we looked at the case dockets, a number of those cases were not even in the system. And this told us that the lack of coordination between police and the child protection system meant that these cases were not being taken seriously and not investigated as a real police investigation, that they were low priority for the police and perpetrators were generally getting away with murder. So the question was, how can we improve our system so that the rights of children who are dying are protected. And based on, the, on those gaps identified by the child homicide study, as well as the review of international best practices, what we then proposed was, and I'm not sure if Lorna Martin's in the audience, but Lorna Martin and I worked together at that stage to start thinking about how might we support um, and improve the system. And we started up thinking about this very much as an academic exercise and then thinking about how can we implement an intervention to then respond to the systemic problems that we were seeing. Internationally, child death review teams were being implemented to review how the system was working to allow children to be dying at the hands of their parents or caregivers. And we then tested an intersectoral model, which we call child death reviews, at a pilot site at the, in the Western Cape, at Salt River Mortuary and at Phoenix Mortuary in KwaZulu Natal. And at its core, it was using a multidisciplinary team approach to foster intersectoral collaboration, where we bring together data systemically, systematically for each child death. And we bring together the, and it's forensic pathology, the forensic pathologist, pediatricians, the National Prosecuting Authority, police, um, the P, um, 
as well as education sectors come together on a monthly basis to reduce the step. High level, so in terms of, we then did a process evaluation and did an action research project to see whether the, this model of reviewing child deaths, whether in fact it is a feasible approach for South Africa. What we found was that multi-agency child death review uh, teams improve communication between role players and that I think that's still the most important outcome out of everything because it allowed us to speak to each other, it allows a system that's responsive immediately and it doesn't mean that it has to be a preliminary investigation. It was a new way of approaching these investigations and management of child deaths and within this collaborative case management approach, we would get speedier, we actually get speedier case outcomes, which means it goes through the criminal justice system almost immediately. And it increases the support and protection for remaining children. It's an early warning sign for other children in the family as well. And really importantly out of that, what we have seen is that the, the child death review project has been integrated into usual care within the Western Cape and it's been rolled out across the province, which I think is amazing. And Tracy, you were there within the Western Cape um, Department of Health at the time when we started these discussions. So I think it's amazing that the Western Cape has seen that they can take it on. So all of this then has led to my thinking around the intergenerational cycling of violence and how violence then the trajectory across the life course. So what we do see is that the impact of violence in childhood goes beyond the scars. It has a lasting impact on the child's self-esteem, psychological development, learning ability, employment prospects, life expectancy. But most importantly, it also leads to risk-taking violent behavior that compromises well-being of the child as well as their life chances. And trauma during early childhood particularly affects brain development, enhances uh, enhancing antisocial behavior, as well as in, inhibiting the child's ability to <coughs> empathize. And therefore it's really, really important that we understand that violence doesn't just have an immediate effect, but it has long lasting cumulative effects on the child. This is just a narrative of a, in one of the research projects that uh, we were involved in, and, and in fact, um, my, one of my PhD students, Natasha, who's in the um, audience today, she did some of this research with me. But what's really important out of this research is, is that when a child discloses abuse, it often triggers a trauma response in those around them as well. And in this particular case, the mother had never disclosed her own experiences of being sexually abused as a young girl herself. And our system doesn't allow for the kind of care that our families are requiring. And what this research has shown us is that, in fact, our system looks at the child and doesn't look at the mother, and doesn't look at holistically how the family needs to be supported at the time when they're actually in crisis. And that we do have a fragmented system where children and caregivers or children and their families are seen as very diff as, as, as a siloed approach and that we don't deliver joined up services. And thinking about this intergenerational cycling of violence, we certainly see that girls are in at increased risk for internalizing experiences and therefore are at increased risk for depression, suicidality, and anxiety disorders, as well as increased victimization, as re-victimization as adults. While boys, it reduces the ability to form emotional attachments, as I've shown you earlier, and it increases their chance of beca becoming violent adolescent. Oops, wow, where have I gone to? In previews, hey. So it increases the chance of becoming violent during adolescence and adulthood. So if we start thinking about the impact of violence in the home against boys, particularly what we do see is what this man, when I interviewed him at 45, describes when he was a young child, 
but it impacted on his own sense of safety and security. It exacerbated his own feelings of feeling powerless to protect his mother. And these repeated painful experiences then becomes internalized and impacts on who they become. So all this work then, I was asked to write an expert affidavit for the South Houghton High Court in 2017. And it was looking at the issue of corporal punishment. For more than a decade at the time, the Children's Institute was advocating to end um, corporal punishment in the home. And using the evidence that I had collected in my research over a number of years, I was able to, to write an expert affidavit that went to the South Houghton High Court. The judgment was appealed by FORSA, who was Freedom of Religion in South Africa, and they appealed it and said, but what about parental rights? Can't we discipline our child? But the problem with disciplining is that how do you, there's such a gray area, what is discipline and what is um, abuse? And it was taken to the Constitutional Court and the Comfort um, ruling in September of 2019 Rule that the common law of reasonable and moderate parental chastisement is unconstitutional and it has laid the pathway for it to be legislated in the Children's Act Amendment Bill. So, really significant that one can use your research very powerfully to shape um, policy in South Africa. So, thinking about my work around services and thinking about how we strengthen services and, and thinking about violence against women and children. In the late, around about 2009-2010, um, I did work with RAPCAN, who was, a, who was then a child rights organization in South Africa. And we explored the co-victimization of mothers and children who had access, uh, who access services to look at how services respond to co-victimization. And what that research really found was that service providers do not identify the link, although they identify the link between um, intergenerational violence and they talk about it, they don't see the link between when you see a woman at a service that you actually have to think about how the violence is impacted on their children. And we've got, as I've said before, we've got sis separate systems of treatment and care that have been developed for child victims and adult victims and they don't see them together. So in a study where we looked at mental health recovery post-sexual abuse for, for children who access to Gisela care centers, what we did find was that a year after accessing service, nearly 50% of those children still had full term, full, still had PTSD, full symptom PTSD. And if that tells us a lot about our models of care that we're implementing currently in terms of reducing trauma in childhood. So high levels of mental health distress certainly indicates that we have to think about our therapeutic models of care for children who've been exposed to violence and abuse. And that leads me into thinking that's so critical that we have to respond. And it's not just about thinking about responding to after a woman or child have been exposed to violence, but how we think about violence prevention and prevent it early. So if we're thinking about the model of violence prevention, historically, violence prevention has been conceptualized using a public health lens, thinking about it primary before violence, you've been exposed to violence. Secondary prevention aims to detect violence early, and then tertiary prevention is when it's around the response services that a lot of us are involved in that meets the needs of the survivors to limit the impacts of the violence. But more recently, violence prevention have been recategorizing, thinking about the groups that you're wanting to target. So thinking about universal prevention, meaning that you're able to direct programs at entire populations, Thinking about prevention and selective, so those at high risk and just targeting high risk communities, or thinking about response that offer services to address the short term or long term effects of violent survivors. And all of, all of this work then thinks about how you can reduce long term outcomes. 
I want to talk about the conceptualization and thinking about drivers of violence against women and children. And I think one of the ways of thinking about it is very important is using the socio-ecological model that allows us to understand that violence is complex, that there's no single factor that can explain why some women and some children experience violence, but that there's a web of interrelated factors that drive experiences. Um, it's a useful tool also to explain that multiple factors operating across these different levels at the individual, interpersonal, community and societal level all influence of, of how and why you experience violence. And the model can also start letting us analyze how risk factors at different levels intersect to increase or decrease the likelihood of violence. And these distinct risk factors, therefore, vary across different settings. I think that's really important. What I want to say is that what's a risk factor here in South Africa might not be the same in another setting. And therefore, it's important for us to also consider within this model, not just what drives violence, but also what are the protective factors. Because once we understand this as a model, we can start thinking about what are the pathways we want to disrupt in order for violence to be prevented. As my understanding of violence has grown, so has my th theoretical conceptualization as well. And more recently, I've started integrating what, what is called the feminist, intersectional feminist framework that takes into account that certain characteristics give some people power over others. And we know that, we see that in our everyday. This frames the broader context in which violence occur and how it affects households and individuals. That patriarchy, and the hierarchy within families are maintained through patriarchy and that male power subordinates, uh, provides the power then to subordinate family members, women and children. And it's based on this framework that I've come to understand that pro for programs to succeed, they need to keep women and children at the center. For it to be transformative, you have to work in partnerships, you can't work alone, and you've got to think about your local women and children's organizations that are in being to improve the outcomes for children. So it's not just about legislative changes, but also thinking about how you shift and how you shift the norms within our communities. More recently, I've come to understand also how these interconnections come together. And we certainly see that there are shared risks between violence against women and children. And the shared risks are around patriarchy, community structures, unemployment, weak legal sanctions, all drive what we see as a problem with violence against women and children. We also know that they're underpinned by common social norms that condone and justify and excuse the use of violence that's underpinned by gender equality, inequality that drives both these forms of violence. But both, and I've come to show you that both violence against women and children have intergenerational effects and consequences. And definitely what we do know is that adolescence is a time and a period of increased risks for, for young girls in particular. Recently, we've completed qualitative investigation to find out more about how these intersections play out in our communities in the Western Cape. And we wanted to examine both communities' perceptions of violence against women and children and how these social norms underpin both these forms of violence and how families commonly experience them. And in short, and there's a long report which you can get, but what we found was that various forms of violence masquerade as socially acceptable and even encouraged in some circumstances. Children's risk to become a, a victim of violence in the home starts early. And experiences are, are shaped by social norms both in the home and in communities. Families reinforce a patriarchal structure that devalues the position of children, and that's really important. And sexual violence is still very hidden. And it's exacerbated by taboos in families, not to discuss sex and sexuality. And violence in the home is still considered very private, and it affects how communities as well as families respond and often keep silent. So, thinking about my trajectory and, and this research that I've just explained to you, we've done it in partnership with a community-based organization called um, Mosaic in the Western Cape. 
And what we've done with the research is that we not just thinking about research, but also say, how does this research translate into practice? And how do we influence the program that's being implemented in, in a community? So we've been working with Mosaic to design, adapt, and intervention to draw on their practitioner-based knowledge and ways of thinking, and not just the academic exercise that we, we, um, we have been through. Drawing on this intersectional frame, feminist approach, we've kept women and children at the center. Our focus for program adaptation has been in four main areas. We started off to map all the programs that Mosaic currently has around prevention. We built capacity within Mosaic to understand how you adapt programs and how using an implementation science lens. We've also in the process of co-creating a research informed program using a theory of change that is co-designed by us as an institution at the, at the university, but also is practitioner informed and adapted to be able to be implemented in violent communities within the Western Cape. And the idea is to do a feasibility study to, to see whether this can work in, in the South African context. So, Thinking into the whole body of work that I've currently shared with you, there's been a buildup of understanding that there's a critical need for violence to be prevented. Our understanding of what works to prevent violence have certainly been, I would say over the past decade, have grown and we certainly know much more now than what we knew 10 years ago. The UK government through the What Works to Prevent Violence and, women, and Girls at the Time program um, looked at a suite of programs that started to move our, the field forward in terms of what holds promise. And what we do see up emerging out of the What Works One program is that there are promising areas. We see economic transfer programs that includes combining economic interventions such as microfinance with gender transformative programming for women has shown to be effective to reduce IPV as well as prevent it. Couples interventions focused on transforming gender relations with an integration of alcohol prevention and violence also is effective in reducing IPV, intimate partner violence. I should stop using acronyms here. Hey? Whilst parenting programs with a focus of, on, on improving parenting skills combined with gender, shifting gender norms in relationships are effective in reducing both intimate partner violence as well as harsh parenting practices. We also see that community activism to shift harmful gender attitudes and social norms are showing promise, but it needs to be long term and intensive. So there need to be resources to implement. I've been doing research into the whole area around school-based violence interventions, and certainly there's a no-brainer that you can invest in school-based interventions with a focus on gender relationships to prevent dating violence, sexual violence as well, as well as peer violence. Bullying can be reduced using methods that use participatory learning. Lastly, mental health interventions that work with individuals and couples can reduce alcohol and substance abuse as well as intimate partner violence. So this is really, really important information because what it tells us is that there's a suite of programs that's showing promise. But these are not magic words because we need to know more about these. Importantly, we need to sharpen what we know around what is required to reduce violence against women and children. And Lily, Lily Arts and I are part of a consortium and we've won an amazing book um, with a consortium of colleagues from George Washington University, Johns Hopkins University, Aga Khan University um, and Kenyatta University. As a consortium, we will be leading a group, a global group, a global group of research projects. I think it's 58 over the next seven to 10 years from 
part, we will be leaving some of it out of the University of Cape Town and others, to, but it will be focusing on the global south. And the reason for doing this is that there is a need to urgently advance our knowledge around violence prevention, not just in South Africa, but globally. We need to deepen our knowledge around under-researched forms of violence against women and children and what drives these forms of violence. We need to establish what interventions are most effective in what context and how we can address multiple forms of violence. We need to un also understand how to scale up these interventions successfully without losing its efficacy. But critical to all of this, we don't have a real understanding how programs are best delivered, what, at what intensity and what the core components are. So, Watch the space over the next seven years. We're going to be delivering awesome work out of the university, but in partnership, because I think the important thing for us to remember is, is that the work we're going to be doing over the next seven years or so, really, that it not only comes back with resources from the UK government, so it's well resourced, but the lens of it's also going to be used that it's going to be in partnership with feminist -led organizations in the global south that you're aiming to build on practitioner knowledge, just not just researcher knowledge. And that's really important in terms of keeping the feminist agenda alive. I know I'm going over time. So just lastly, and I'm wanting to segue back to where I probably started. So I serve on the Lancet Commission on Gender-Based Violence and Child Maltreatment, and it's doing amazing work and lots of different things. But the one thing that I'm most excited about is that I'm leading a country case study for South Africa, and it's looking at costing, and it's looking at the epidemiology and the burden. But what I'm most excited about is that, excited about is that one of the works in I'm leading, I'm doing a case study on social movements and their impact on GBV policy. And with that, we've been having intergenerational conversations with old activists, young activists, and doing interviews with um, activists over the years, and using a decolonial feminist lens to, un to really understand our trajectory in South Africa. And I don't know if Benita Moorman is here, but she's my co-investigator on this particular case study. And she's teaching me about decolonial feminism. So I, I'm trying to understand that in my own trajectory. But really what I want to say is the most powerful thing coming out of this are the intergenerational conversations and how I've explained to you my involvement in women's movements in the 1998-99 and how different it is now. And thinking about how in 2018 the women's movement movements demanded a proactive stance from government and in fact the president to address GBV through the total shutdown movement used in social media. And that was able to mobilize women across South Africa. And I was thinking that Lily, when we worked in the um, Western Cape, uh, you know, Western Cape network on violence against women, we didn't even have a cell phone then. So how could we Twitter? Yes, exactly. So movement building and how you can use social movements now, it's very different. So I think we, there's exciting things to come. And what we have seen over the past three, four years, since 2018, have been the amendments of three important GB goals to strengthen the criminal justice system. But I want to leave you with a thought. So, this is one of the interviews done with a young activist. And I think what she's telling us is that progressive legislation on its own cannot substantively change the experiences of poor black women. And I think it speaks to the intersection of disadvantage that most of our women in communities are experiencing. And therefore, it is a barrier to realizing and accessing rights for women in South Africa, as well as children. So I want to go back to engaged scholarship. What I've come to show you is that certainly all my work across the three decades have been seeking to contribute to practice that lead to societal change, and it's not just the pro production of knowledge. At a practice level, what I do is, is about helping 
want to better understand issues of social justice. At the research level, it's about carrying out research with those that have experienced the issue in the community and using the evidence for, with those who are working on the ground to effect change. And for me, this is the true nature of engaged scholarship is around the questions I'm asking and that it will have, and it's never just an academic exercise, but it, it's about how it's going to impact on the lives of women and children on a daily basis. So I leave you with a call to action. I can't be an activist without doing this. <laughs> In terms of our donors, I really want to say to donors that it's critically important for you to invest in, in providing the resources to build a rigorous evidence base on what works to prevent and end violence. Our government, we've got to prioritise implementation of legislation as well as national action plans. For us as researchers, we need to focus on strengthening programmes Crush to the prevention and response continuum, as well as working partnerships between researchers and practitioners. We cannot have this work siloed. For all of us sitting in this room and listening to me today, the biggest challenge is around changing norms and behaviour that drives violence. We've got to be thinking about our own practices, our own, our own ways of being and how we can shift that. And for the university, Lionel, we've got to be thinking about building the next generation of engaged scholars that's equipped to tackle the complexities of the real world. Problems. So I leave us all with a very, very heavy task because as I've worked in this field for 30 years, I reflect on what I've done and I keep on saying, have I done enough? And I don't think I have. So in closing, it leaves me to You started off crying, and I can't end off by crying. And I've got to leave you with this. My biggest fan has been my mom. She didn't know what a PhD was or what it meant, but she'd always ask me, when are you finishing your writing? <laughs> And she passed on just before I finished my PhD. So in many ways, I do dedicate my life's work to her. And to my dad, who encouraged me always to study. And I remember how he would test my Latin when I was grade eight and I needed to learn all this Latin. And he would sit very patiently and go through it with me. So thank you, Dad or teaching me the value of education. And Dad's 90 and can't be here today, so I'm hoping he's enjoyed this afternoon. To my husband, who has always quietly supported me in my work and have been at my side for 37 years. But the most important thing he brings to this very gloomy area that I've worked in is laughter on a daily basis. It still makes me laugh. Yeah. <laughs> um, yes, he does make all of us laugh. So. Someone said to me, please tell a joke. And I, he oh. says to me, don't. I? <laughs> Leave that to me. <laughs> I, I couldn't tell a joke. <laughs> to my daughter, Zahra and Raisa, what do I say? I know they've been my biggest fans over the years, but I did take them along to women's network meetings. And I think I've, I've, you know, I think what they've learned out of that is to be strong, independent women. So, yeah, I think if I've given you that to be independent and strong, I've, I've done my work. But thank you for all the hugs and kisses. When you didn't really know what the work I was doing, and you know, they struggled to understand exactly what a youth mom does, and I don't know whether I've clarified it today. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm hoping that I've clarified it.
And to forget people, but lastly, to acknowledge the team at the CI for providing me with this amazing opportunity to follow my dreams, to provide me with the intellectual space to further my body of work. So thank you, all my colleagues in, in the lecture today. And then over the years, I've had a number of mentors. I think back, um, Rashida Shabuddin at the Gender Advocacy Program. She taught me what it is to be an advocate. And I think she taught me well. To Naima, I'm not sure if you're here. There you are. Naima, we've had loads of conversations, but it's not just the mentorship, but also the friendship along the way that have been amazing. And Rachel isn't here today, but also Rachel Jukes, um, intellectually, that have grown me to where I am today. I'm going to miss a lot of people, but but just to think about my collaborators, and I don't know, Lorna's not here, but Lorna's been the one collaborator, you know, have, have been with me across the decades. And Mary Alsberg, I don't know if you're listening to me today, but Mary, and Naima, you and I and Mary have been through Africa. We've had trials and tribulations together, and, and it's those collaborations and friends, it's more than collaboration, it's friendships that you develop. But I also want to acknowledge the amazing women that have been part of the Violence Against Women Network, who have where we had these long conversations with flip charts, you write, Lilies, and <coughs> who've been a part of my life and an amazing support over the years. And lastly, I want to acknowledge all the women, children, and men who've been the subjects of my research over the years, that I've used you to really understand my subject. So thank you all, and I know I've probably gone uh, grossly over time, but thank you. <laughs> uh, good evening, colleagues, Moloeni, Sanibonani, Dumelang. Greetings, everybody. My name is uh, Tracy Naledi. I am the Deputy Dean for <coughs> Social Accountability and, and Health Systems and also the Chairperson of the Board of uh, the Children's Institute. Um, I'd like to, to greet in particular our woman of the day, Professor Shanaz Matthews, and uh, your family uh, that you've already introduced us to, Shamil, Zahra, Raisa, Nura, and your dad, hopefully online with Raisa, and your friends and all your colleagues that are joining you today, uh, both here in person and virtually. Thank you, Lano, um, for bringing back the prestige and honor of uh, inaugural lectures where our esteemed colleagues, such as Shanaz, have the opportunity to profess their knowledge to us as some of us, you know, some of the, the subjects that get presented in, in, in these inaugurals are quite technical and, it, and it's um, quite lovely that uh, these inaugurals provide us an opportunity for all of us to understand. And thank you very much, Shanaz, for breaking it down for us and really um, making good effort to make us understand. So as part of the faculty's 110 uh, year celebrations, um, Lionel, you've purposefully kind of foregrounded stories that we would not ordinarily have heard 110 years ago. Uh, and in fact, not uh, so long ago. Um, it's not so long ago. I mean, Shanaz spoke about her own experience of coming to this university, which is not that long. So it is quite apt that um, the stories that we've heard so far in these inaugurals in this um, time have largely been from women. Um, and as a woman, I thank you for that, for giving us the space and the platform to tell our stories. This lecture, as Ruzani has alluded to, is also situated in, in Women's Month. And we're about to celebrate Women's Day in a few days. Um, a day that is an anniversary of um, Great Women's March of 1956, where about 20,000 women marched to the Union buildings to protest against the carrying of the pass books, which was a way that the apartheid regime at the time 
was really trying to control women and women's bodies and movement, women's movements. Part of the petition of the day read that we, the women of South Africa, have come here today. We are African women. Uh, we African women know too well the effects of this law upon our homes, our children. We who are not African women know our sisters suffer. For to us, an insult to African women is an insult to all women. We shall resist until we have won for our children their fundamental rights of freedom, justice, and security. So thank you, Shanas, for taking this on. And your talk today and your work over the last three decades, as you've shown us, has really carried the spirit intuitively. And you've lived your academic life in resistance and advocacy for, for women and children who have been silenced by violence and death. You have said, they might beat you, they might kill you, but your story will be told. Your story will make a difference. Your story will make others understand how you found yourself in this cold metal sheet. Your story will be a pathway for advocacy and policy change. Your story will be a path to freedom and justice. Thank you, Shanaz, for speaking for those who could not speak for themselves. So today is a day of firsts. Ruzani told you that it was the first time he was introducing the first time I'm doing a vote of thanks, and I've been fretting about this the whole time, and I what's up, Lionel, in the middle of the night last night, <laughs> really nervous about today. But in preparation for this, I've had many, many helpers um, to prepare this vote of thanks. And I watched my elders from other inaugurals, how they did it, and so I unashamedly copied. <laughs> um, and all of them did really in-depth qualitative research <laughs> of key informants, <laughs> undertook thematic analysis. Uh, and I'm feeling quite strong because I'm in the middle of my PhD and I've just learned how to do that. So I'm like, I can do this. <laughs> so I went out and I undertook a convenient sample <laughs> of all your colleagues, your family members, and they were my key importance. And like Dan Stein at the last in inaugural of Catherine Sosdal, I spent sleepless nights in us, you have to know, <laughs> analyzing my data for this presentation. And so I'd like to thank, uh, thank my key informants, many of them are in the room, some are online, uh, who helped me put this together. And in fact, from here on, this is mostly their voice and not mine. I'm simply the vehicle. So Nyanibonga, Kyaleboha, thank you wherever you are for making me uh, sound a, uh, like a little bit like I know what I'm talking about. <laughs> so in my extensive research, uh, and you've heard this already, um, that Shanaz comes from the trenches as a social worker. Um, and a number of her colleagues actually including me, knew her academic reputation before we actually met her. We've always known, even in the department, as you alluded to, I've always known of this Shanaz Matthews, you know? <laughs> and um, in fact, for me, as you've alluded to, I was quite pleased when you invited my unit at the time to collaborate with you on the child death review with Lorna Martin and others, and uh, Professor David Kutsia, who was in my team at the time as a joint staff member, was actually the person that we allocated to collaborate with you. And as a department, we were able to share some of this data that allowed you to, to, to do all of this work. Little did I realize that our paths would cross again uh, when now I'm the representative of the Dean um, on the CI board. So um, many of Shanaz's colleagues have, have um, 
express profound gratitude to the university for recognizing Shanaz and her engaged scholarship in socially, uh, by awarding her this promotion to full professor. Her colleagues, however, are very, very quick to note that the university has not done her any favors, as I'm sure you will agree, <laughs> that in fact she has brought international recognition to UCT and put UCT on the map as a center of excellence in her field. Her staff at CI acknowledge that she has brought gender and research into CI, even though CI was well respected before Shanaz has taken, but Shanaz has really taken this re reputation to a whole new level and expanded it globally uh, with major research grants that she has won, that um, you, uh, she has spoken about just now. So Shanaz has been at the forefront of actually developing the academic rigor in her field. One of her colleagues noted that um, she worked with Shanaz, uh, Shanaz also alluded to this in the 2014 child gauge. What Shanaz didn't say is that at the time when they wrote the child gauge is that they actually did not have very good data. But Shanaz being the woman of many gifts, who's not beaten by anything, decided that she will find the answer. Then she went and she then did a national prevalence survey to actually find out the data so that she can actually be able, as she said, be able to inform policy with very good data. She not only looked at data, but as she said, looked at implementation research so that actually we can know how to implement all of these wonderful things that academics recommend and um, to test actually if, that they, if they work. Her colleagues say that she's got superpowers. And her superpowers come from her commitment to engage with communities, to make violence prevention interventions contextually and locally relevant by using decolonial methods of working to co-produce knowledge and ensure voices from the ground are heard. She has the ability to balance practice-based experiences with evidence-based re um, research to contribute to a realistic knowledge base in the global south. As you've heard for yourself, she is a champion for Africa in the international spaces that she finds herself, be it the Lancet Commission, be it other initiatives around the world. And what she teaches everybody is that don't come here thinking you're going to just use us as subjects and take our data. Ah, uh -uh. No, 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 no. We actually bring skills. We create knowledge. We provide solutions, we provide answers, we have expertise, and we are willing to partner with equals. And then in fact, what we bring and the lessons that we bring has relevance beyond our borders. The knowledge that she generates is not only to enhance her international reputation and academic prowess, she's credited by her colleagues for adopting a transformative approach in engaging communities and research that ensures that their findings are relevant and impactful and empowering so that they themselves can create their knowledge to improve their own lives. No one is coming to save them. They can save themselves. Her colleagues say that she is an epitome of an engaged scholar. In her engaged scholarship journey, Shanaz uh, hasn't only made a path for herself, but she's made a path for others. Her colleagues say that she has truly multiplied herself. Even though you were saying just now, Shanaz, that you don't know if you've done enough, your colleagues have feel great gratitude for what you've done for them. So Mary Ellsberg that you referred to has reflected on your journey together for the last 20 years, together with Naima, Professor Naima Abrams. Hi Naima. Um, and has spoken about the course that you developed, um, also generating the rigor within your research, but has spoken about the multitudes of researchers around Africa and the practitioners that you have produced and developed. 
and many of them, how many of them now are their own independent researchers in, uh, by themselves in their own countries. So I really believe you can be proud of what it is that you have achieved. Your colleagues at CI say that you've mastered the challenge of translating research in, uh, in that shifts policy and programming. And the fact that this engaged scholarship um, that you've chosen that translates research into advocacy um, uh, for, for policy and practice, and that you actually used it as, as an ad hominem, uh, as part of your ad hominem promotion, they say that, that they feel strength that what they bring to the table can also be recognized, that they can also come into the university. Lionel, I was a little bit worried that um, the colleagues kind of feel UCT does not recognize trans translational research. Um, but I think Shanaz says that we actually do. So maybe we need a lot more Shanazes so that those people out there who are uh, doing translational research can also feel that they matter. You spoke about, you've spoken about your, collab your collaborators and how um, you've collaborated with them. And you've, you've worked with a multitude of organizations of civil society, et cetera. And that has been one of your greatest gifts, your ability to work with others because of your humility and because of the way you always bring others along with you. But I've been told that your advocacy efforts have gotten you into trouble. Yeah. I've been told by Naima. <laughs> <laughs> that when you were at the Western Cape Women's Network um, against, uh, against um, uh, 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 violence, that you were insisting that the leadership must be women. <laughs> and then the women, the men were fighting you. <laughs> and the men wanted to be as usual, the ones in front telling us what to do. And apparently, they were not only just fighting you there, they took you to the gender commission, <laughs> saying you were discriminating against them, Tana. <laughs> I found that quite hilarious. <laughs> Can't we have sacred space? <laughs> Thankfully, those men were put in their place by the commission, who schooled them on what allyship really is. More listening, more self-reflection on your own biases, less talking and taking up space that does not belong to you. Rather, use your power and privilege to amplify the marginalized voice of women. The manner in which you engage in us has been greatly appreciated. One of your colleagues spoke about how many academics have big egos and patriarchal tendencies. But you, on the other hand, display humility, thoughtfulness, and care for others. You are thought of as a thought leader, ground baker, breaker, and light bringer. I love that. A light bringer. You have a democratic leadership style, and you are, allow all voices to be heard. You are a shining example of a socially responsive academic who is able to find a steady balance between your academic endeavors, leadership, management roles, and advocacy. Very supportive, I'm told, that you go beyond the call of duty to support and mentor young colleagues and students, particularly Black students. That you are able to find talent, you are able to make people believe that they can do things that even they themselves cannot believe that they can do. Your colleagues, however, are a bit intimidated by how well you can juggle things. Um, they struck about they are they are struck by your drive, your determination, and how many things you can do in one day and in one week. 
and your family. Really, I'm grateful to Raisa, by the way. Raisa is another superwoman, wherever you are, Raisa. I happen to have worked with her as one of the student leaders at Shoko, and I didn't even know she was uh, Shanaz's daughter until at the end of her term. And when I was introduced to her and she told me she was your daughter, I was like, aha! <laughs> um, so your family also is in awe of how you can do it all, how you can understand that you still make home-cooked meals every night, that you drop everything. Even your colleagues have said so, that even though Shanaz is this hard-working woman and academic, but when her family calls, she drops everything and sees to them. So Shanaz, the juggler of many balls, the doer of things with grace, with perfection and humility. We at GCT are lucky to have you because you bring to us what you give to your family. You are meticulous in everything that you do. You put, you set the bar very high. You inspire us to be the best that we can be. And you make us believe we can do more in a 24 hour day than we are capable, we think we are capable. So as a fellow black woman, I can say, Shanaz, You've made us proud. You've made us want to walk with our heads held up high, <clears throat> making us feel that we matter. Our stories matter. Nanima reflected on one of the stories you told her about your mom. As you said, she was your biggest supporter. Naima told me that your mom used to take you and your sisters to the library and got you to really love reading and education. Today, I'm very certain that she's looking down on you and feeling incredibly proud of the woman you have become and the acad academic that you are, and in particular, the engaged scholar that you are and the impact that you have on the community and the world at large. Tina City, thank you for the inspiration. Thank you for leading with your feminine side and leading with humility, with care and with grace. Malbong Kamalamakoskas, I thank you. Okay, don't leave me hanging. I'm warning you, don't leave me hanging, okay? <laughs> So just to conclude this evening, I'm deeply grateful that this is the event that kicks off our reflection on the Month of Women. And the faculty, we want to value the story. So thank you, Krishnas. Thank you, Shumila, and your family for being part of this celebration. It's not often that we gather with family to recognize the source of our, of our achievement. And so I'm very grateful that you're here today. But I think that this month you will hear more from us in terms of celebrating our women. This is the first event for this month that we will think about our anniversary in a way that values story. Today's story is not a happy story, but it ends with the call to the fact that we can make a difference in our world. And there are plans that emerge from our scholarship that guide us as to what those plans might be. And so friends, families, Please join us for some refreshments after this. Um, it's a time for us to just renew that sense of being together um, with or without our masks. So uh, <laughs> please join us for, for some refreshments after this. But thank you very much. And as you see, Kai Kangang is what the original people might say. I'm going to ask you to stand as I ask Shanaz to lead the procession out of the room. I love it.